Hello and welcome back to part two of this Blender Cookie tutorial on creating a CG Cookie coffee cup. In part two of this we're going to pick up where we left off on the previous one and begin the texturing and rendering process and this is going to include texturing all the different components of our cup along with rendering it with a nice background using some node compositing for some depth of field and so on. Let's go ahead and get started by first texturing the paper cup now the cup is going to be very very simple we're just going to create a simple pa paper texture but the way that we're going to kind of add a little extra level of interest is by adding in a procedural texture to it most of the texturing we're doing today will be procedural uh, allows us to get pretty good fine-tuned control of it but also not have to worry about hand painting textures so let's first start by adding in a new material and we'll call this um, we'll just call this paper and we're gonna give it a Pretty much a solid white, maybe just a teensy bit gray, right about in there. We're going to go ahead and turn the spec down to about point, uh, about point oh six three or so. Right about there ought to be just about right. We're going to leave the hardness right where it's at. And then we want to go on over and add in a new texture. And this texture we're going to add in as the default clouds. But we want to go ahead and enable the, the ramp color for it and increase the, the noise value all the way up, or the depth value, all the way to six. And on the ramp, we're going to make the left slider a solid, uh, just a solid light gray. So we need to slide up the alpha. And then let's make this just a light gray right about in here, leaving the other side, the default white. And this will just give us a very fine, uh, subtle fiber texture, basically, that we'll be able to add on top of the default white just to add in a little extra texture to it to make it look a little less boring. And then just to map it on top, we're going to go ahead and take the color down to about 0.5 to make it a little more subtle. And then we just want to add in a subtle bump map by checking the normal option under the geometry category. And we'll go and take this down to about 0.3 by just control clicking on it and then typing in 3 on our number pad. And let's go ahead, before we set up any further materials, let's go ahead and set up a nice rendering environment just so that we can see our materials as we're texturing, as we're creating them. And so the first thing that I want to do is to go ahead and add in a main lamp. And this main lamp that we're going to add is going to be an area lamp, which allows us to get fairly nice bright lighting, but that'll be evenly distributed from a single plane. So we choose the area option here after hitting Shift A, choosing the lamp category and area. On this lamp, we're going to go ahead and position it kind of at the bottom left from when looking down from the top view. And let's go ahead and move this up. And then we want to go ahead and rotate it from the front view just to about right there. And then from the top view, we'll go ahead and rotate it around just such that it's pointing at the light here. On the actual settings, we want to go ahead and use the default value of 1, distance of 25, and all the other settings should be just about right, although we want to go ahead and turn on the ray shadow, and we can just leave it at the defaults. So if we go ahead and render this after saving our file, we should see a, a fairly simple cup, a little bit bright, but not too bad. So the next step that I want to do before going in our textures is let's go ahead and enable our ambient occlusion and our environment lighting. First off, the ambient occlusion, which I've actually already got on along with the environment lighting, um, just because I was previously testing this and forgot to turn them off. But we are using an ambient occlusion set to multiply blend mode at a factor of one, the environment lighting at two set to the sky color using a sky color of just gray. And then we're using the ray trace method uh, with a distance of 10 adaptive QMC such that we get a little better quality. And I've just increased the samples to 12 from the default 8. So what we want to do now is go ahead and just um, scale down our area light which will uh, uh, affect the the brightness as well. So if we just scale it down by hitting S we can go ahead and get it down to about where we like it so it's a little less bright and that ought to be just about right for the time being at least because we're going to go ahead now and add in a couple more lights. So on these lights they're going to be just simple point lights we, we can just hit Shift A, add uh, point, and this first one we're going to go ahead and position to the to the right side, right about in here. And on the settings, we want to go ahead and take a an energy value of 0.5, and 
no, um, no specular because we only want this to be a fill light rather than highlights or anything like that, and we don't want it to cast any shadows. In terms of the height, we'll just leave it about the default. Now we can go ahead and we're going to duplicate it, but rather than just duplicating with Shift D, we're just going to go ahead and hit Alt D, which will create a linked copy such that if we change the settings on one of these, such as the energy here, you'll notice that it's changed on both of them. So now both light objects are referencing the same light data. And you can see this definitely if you see that we have two users of this data right here. So we'll go ahead and change this back to about 0.5. And then we're going to hit Alt D again and move this one back to about right here, just back and behind the lamp or the, the cup. And now you'll notice that we have a much softer, kind of more even lighting in here on our cup. So we don't see nearly the, the harsh shadows that we were seeing before. So this ought to work out very, very well for us. So let's go ahead and work with our textures a bit more. Um, we'll go ahead and do the, the, the lid first. And on the lid, it's going to be pretty simple. It's going to be mostly a, a dark, dark gray. We don't want to go straight black because then uh, you're going to lose a lot of the detail in here because we're also going to be throwing in a bump map to add in a little extra detail. And so let's go ahead and take in, put in a dark gray just to about... About like that, I'd be about right. You know, not completely black, but dark enough to tell that, you know, it's pretty much black. And also because we don't have any pure blacks in nature. And let's go ahead and increase the intensity all the way to 1, so it'll reflect a bit more light. Let's take the specular intensity up to about a 6, not 0.69, and the hardness all the way to 250. And then we can go ahead and we'll render this first just so you can see what it looks like. But before doing that, just so that we can see both our 3D view and, oh, excuse me, our render at the same time, let's go ahead and split our view by hovering our mouse over the handle at the bottom left corner of the viewport. And then left click and dragging to split it. We'll change the left side over to a UV image editor, which is already by default pointed to the render result. And so now when we render this, it'll automatically just speed it into the UV image editor allowing us to see both views at the same time. And you can see we're getting a very nice dark gray in here, but let's add a bit of interest by placing a decal on the top of here, perhaps with a recycle symbol um, that also says CG Cookie. And I've already created this, this emblem that we're going to add in as the bump map. So let's first just load it in as an image texture. It's gonna be very, very simple. And all we need to do is add in a new texture which we'll go ahead and call this CGC Recycle. And we're going to change it to a image type. Then we can just go ahead and go down to the image panel here, which sometimes is at the bottom, sometimes is at the top. And to be perfectly honest, I have no idea why it moves other than that it does. And we'll go and click Open. And we can find it underneath our Textures folder in the Recycle logo right here. And you'll notice I've already created these beforehand. Uh, there's not really any need to go over how to create these because all they are is straight black and or white, in the case of this one, um, overlaid on a 50% gray background. So very, very simple. But if we go ahead and click Open, and let's just see what happens when we render this. And what happens is that the lid is now just a solid 50% gray with the logo stretched across it. And it doesn't look any good. So what we want to do is first off, we want to go ahead and tell this to not affect the color at all, which we can do underneath the, the influence panel. So we'll uncheck the color, and then we want to check the geometry, and we're going to turn it down to a negative 2, such that it's push, putting an indent in the, top, in the cup. And if we render this, we can see exactly that right in here. So that starts to look pretty cool, except for the fact that it's in the wrong position. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to hit X on the render result. We're going to hit 7 in our viewport here, and then tab to go into edit mode. And ignore the fact that you just saw that, because you didn't. That was from my previous test. We'll load in our recycle logo right there. And then we want to just hit U and project from view. And the reason that project from view is going to work for this, after we then scale it up, and position the logo right in here. The reason that it works for us is because we only want to project this logo on this very top portion, which is perfectly flat. And so by projecting from view, we get a perfect unwrap of those faces. And if we now switch this back over to the render result, hit 1 to go to normal size, and hit F12 to render it, you'll see what I mean. 
well, actually not quite, because we forgot a step, and that is underneath the mapping, we need to change the coordinates from generated to UV. And if we now render this, we should see it looks pretty much perfect. And I'm partially a liar, but you can see that it works right here, but we're seeing it extended past on these other areas. And this is because we need to do one more setting, and that is underneath the image mapping, we want to change the extension to extend. Currently it's set to repeat, so since the image is only the size of the UV view uh, right here, it's going to repeat after this edge every time, which is not what we want to happen. And so what we want to happen is for it to map to the edge of the UV panel and then stop. And so we want to go ahead and change this to extend, which will also tell it to extend the colors of the border image of the border of the image past the border infinitely. And this way, you know, if we were to go ahead and just set this to to clip, what you would see is this edge right here, which when combined with the normal or, or with the bump map, we're going to see an edge of our bump map right in here. Like you can see, we have that square edge. So by setting it to extend, we ensure that that doesn't happen. And if we render this, you'll see exactly that. There we go. Perfect. So now what we want to do is go ahead and texture the sleeve. So on the sleeve, we're going to do this in a couple of different ways. The first one is to go ahead and just set a the basic color for it. And the color will just add in a new material. We'll go ahead and call this uh, Java Jacket. And we'll save the file. And we want to go ahead and just grab in a nice tan, which we can see maybe something right in about like that should be just about right. Uh, the original values I used was 400, 265, and 154. So let's go ahead and just grab that 0 0.400, 0 0.255, and 0 0.154. It's just about right, you know, just a little bit different. Then I went ahead and used a spec value of 0 0.05 and the default hardness of 50. And so this gives us our basic coloring in here, which, you know, is nothing, nothing too fancy, obviously. But the next step is we want to go and add some good interest to this by adding in a nice logo to it. You know, most Java jackets or sleeves, whatever you want to call them, have a logo or some text or even an advertisement on it. So let's go ahead and throw in that second logo that I created, the CG Cookie Java. And we'll do this by adding in a texture first. And we're going to change this to an image texture. We'll click open and underneath our rep textures we'll just double click on the CG Cookie Java logo. We're going to do the same thing before that we set it to extend and then we're going to do a few things differently and the first thing is to go ahead and position this perfectly how I want it. So the way that I want to do it is let's just go ahead and select this and since I have used a solidify modifier on it It'll work very easily to just go ahead and hit U and unwrap. After doing so, I can go ahead and click open and choose my CG Cookie logo and then scale this up. And maybe I'll just go ahead and place it right there. But just to double check my placement, let's go ahead and turn on underneath the display by hitting in, turn on the texture solid option. So then I can just scale this up. Maybe I will go ahead and flip this along the Y axis. So I'll hit S, Y, and negative one. And then you can see it's also backwards, so I'll hit S, X, and negative 1. And then we'll go ahead and scale this up to be about right there. Now, one slight problem with this is, you know, this technique works fine, except for one major concern. And that is, first off, we see some distortion in here that we really don't like. And, you know, do note that we would only be mapping this once. But we also see some distortion in the text, and we really don't have really good control just because of the distortion in our UV map. You know, since we don't have a perfectly square mesh right here, essentially, it's not going to unwrap as cleanly as we would like because this ought to be a absolute perfect logo since it's essentially just printed on paper. And so an even better way to do this is by mapping it with a an empty. And so on an empty, it allows us to use basic or pl place decals exactly how we want them. And I did a tip on doing this exact technique on Blender Cookie that you can go ahead and access. But we'll do it again by hitting Shift A, add an empty, and then 
decals are mapped along the z-axis, so we want to go and rotate this around the x-axis 90 degrees by hitting R, X, and then typing in 90. And then we'll go ahead and move this out along the y-axis, and let's first just see what happens when we map it to that. And the way that we do that is by just going down to the mapping, change it to an object type, and then set this to the empty. We'll save our file, and then let's just hit F12 and see what this looks like. So you'll see it's mapped precisely where the empty is. Uh, it's a little bit too big, and you'll notice that it pretty much just goes to the tip of the empty on, in both directions. So let's go ahead and just scale this down, maybe move it down a little bit, and then hit render again. And that looks about right, but we don't want it overlapping this gap. So let's go ahead and switch this side over to render result. And then let's hit period on our keyboard so we can then just rotate around the cursor. And then holding down control, let's just rotate this around to maybe about right there. You know, keeping it perfectly rotated and positioned. And that looks pretty good, although maybe it's a little bit low. So we'll go ahead and raise it up, maybe two increments. And that looks just about right. So I like that a lot. Um, one thing to note, though, is that we still have, we have our gray color over everything since we did the extend option on here. And so what we want to do is we're going to set this to a, a different blending mode, which is, the, which is value. And what that'll do is basically just take the values and burn them into the color such that it almost looks like it was just printed on, on black. So if we just render this, or if it was just printed on the cardboard, we can see what we're getting and looks much, much better. So we're preserving our normal coloring in here. Since we use the 50% gray background, it's basically null or neutral and works very nicely. Okay, let's go ahead and add in a bit more texture to this to make it a bit more interesting. And the first one that we're going to do is to um, add in kind of the, the imprint on this, you know, kind of the, the stamp effect. And the way that we're gonna do this is in using a combination of techniques of UV mapping and procedural textures. So for first on the UV mapping, let's just go ahead and hit U and unwrap. And that's all we're gonna do. We're not gonna do anything else. And then we wanna go in and add in a new texture slot. So we'll add new, and we'll just go ahead and call this pattern one. On it, we're going to use a, a magic texture. And I can already hear a lot of people screaming, you know, because the magic texture is famously awful and distinguished, you know, because it's very easy to pick out when somebody uses it, but we're going to make it a little more subtle. And the way that we're going to do that is by adjusting the, the ramp shader on it. So first let's add in a ramp. The left side, we're going to move over just a little bit. We're going to go ahead and change it to a opaque dark gray, uh, something right about in there. And then the second slider, we're going to move over again and use a lighter gray, but still fairly dark. Maybe something about like, like that will be good. And then we want to go ahead and change it from a linear blend to an ease, such that we get a slightly smoother transition. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go down to the coordinates, map it to a UV such that this is mapped along this right here. And we wanna go ahead and tell it to be the UV text uh, just the default, let's see, let me double check this real quick, see which one we're on. Um, this one is actually going to be the UV, UV text. Um, ignore the fact that I have two of them here, so let's actually just remove that one. So we'll first do this one, which we just hit U and unwrap. We're gonna go in, set it to map to the UV text, because we're gonna be using two of these. And then we wanna change the size here to be 20, 20, and 20. And now it's probably not necessary to do all three of them, but basically what this is doing is telling Blender to repeat this pattern 20 times within this square, or essentially this square. So effectively, we're making it smaller. And then we're gonna go down, and we're going to turn off the color, and just turn on the geometry normal, and put it at 0.2. And now let's go ahead and render this, just to see how it looks. And we're not seeing a lot in here just yet. You know, we're just seeing a little bit of subtle patterns. So let's maybe go ahead and make this a little bit stronger, or let's actually go ahead and turn the color back on and try setting this to a soft light initially. Uh, no, actually, we're going to cancel that. But let's turn the, the normal up to one just to see what happens. And we can see that that's looking pretty strong, so that's maybe too much. We'll go ahead and do about 0.5. Ought to be about right. 
something right in there looks pretty good. You know, you can see some subtle patterns in here. But now to make it a little less obvious that it is a magic pattern, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and choose our pattern one, click this button here to copy the texture slot settings, choose slot two, paste this texture slot settings, and then it's copied all of these settings. But something to note with procedural textures is when you reference the same texture, only the, the magic and the colors, or basically the, the texture in question, and the colors is copied over. Everything below that, as far as the mapping and the influence is concerned, is strictly relevant or, or restricted to the actual channel that you're in. So even if we use the exact same texture in here, the, the mapping options can still be different. So what we'll do is go in and add underneath the object data, let's add in a second UV texture, we'll hit U and unwrap, and then on this, what we're gonna do is we're just going to hit S, X, and negative one to flip it across the X axis. And so what this will effectively do when we go back to the textures is we're gonna slot, change this one to UV text point zero zero one, such that we're mapping two of them over each other. So now we've got basically a, a mesh pattern going on. It allows us to make it a little more interesting and make it a little less obvious that it's a magic pattern. And this is maybe so a little too strong, so we'll take it down to 0.3, which we need to go ahead and do for both of them. We'll render that. And let's go ahead and on to the next step. You know, to make this look really good and make it a little more interesting, we're just going to layer um, a couple more textures on top of this. The first one is we're just going to go ahead and grab in a new channel. We're just going to grab our paper fibers. Let's go ahead and rename this to paper fibers. And we'll rename this one while we're at it to CGC Java logo. And on the paper fibers, let's go ahead and just use the same settings that we did on the previous one. Um, although we're going to turn off the color, turn on the geometry and put it at about a 0.5 and then just render that. And maybe that's not quite strong enough. Maybe we'll go ahead and take this up to say one, render it. And that begins to look a bit better. So now we've got a little bit of that cardboard effect in there. We're also hiding the pattern a bit more. So we're just making it a little more subtle. And that's pretty much it. That's all we're gonna do as far as the textures are concerned. But now we wanna make this a bit more interesting because you know, as far as a render is concerned, while it may look, look like a nice model, it's a very boring presentation. So the first thing let's do is go ahead and add in a drop cloth, you know, very similar to what a photographer might use. And the way that we're gonna do this by hitting Shift A, Add Mesh and Plane, uh, you'll notice that, actually I want to X, hit X, delete that, and I first want to hit Shift C to recenter my cursor at the origin, hit Shift A, add mesh, and plane, then I'll hit Tab to go into edit mode, and I'm just going to hit S to scale, and I'll just type in 20 to make it very large, actually, no, let's go ahead and scale that down to only about 10, and then we'll hit S, X, and scale it twice along or right, how about another twice along the x-axis just to make sure it's nice and wide if we want a wide camera shot. And then we're going to get, select this edge within edit mode, hit E to extrude, take it back, back. You notice we're going back and up, just creating basically a, a drop effect such that if we now go ahead and add in a subsurf modifier from the modifiers panel, subdivision surface, set the, view, the resolutions to 2, optimal display, select everything, W and shade smooth, and then we'll go ahead and add in two loop cuts, which will scale out along the x-axis right to the edge, just so we remove these rounded corners. And that'll give us a very nice gradual drop cloth, which maybe we need to smooth by pulling this edge back a little bit. And then maybe we'll go ahead and pull in this one a little, and then add in another loop back to about there, just to ensure that we have a perfectly flat area. And what we can do now is go ahead and adjust our camera angle just a little bit. You know, if I double tap R, then I can just rotate around a trackball, maybe to about there. That looks about right. And if I render this, you know, I'll see a gradual uh, gradient here in the background, but it's still not quite right because really I would like to have this facing the camera at all times, but I don't wanna have to adjust it every time that I move my camera. So the way that we're going to do this is a nifty little trick by using a constraint, and we're gonna use a copy rotation constraint on our drop cloth, and we're gonna tell it to target the camera, 
but we want to turn off the X and Y axes such that it only rotates when, or follows when the camera rotates around the Z axis. Let me just switch in a top view so you can see this. If we rotate like this, it works perfectly. And if we rotate at all times around the cursor, it works even better. And you know, normally when I position the camera, I like to rotate around the cursor anyway because it gives me, gives me really fine-tuned control and allows me to just kind of dolly around the camera. So it works nicely like that. And now this always follows my camera with me. But, you know, this is still a little boring. This is just, you know, a nice gray. Well, let's make this a bit more interesting by adding in a new material. We'll go ahead and remove the specularity from it because we don't want to see any specular highlights in our background. And then now let's just make this a very nice kind of sea blue. So we'll just choose this um, maybe about we'll choose a nice blue right in here. Maybe take it down a good bit. In fact we'll just go ahead and maybe take this down to about 0.7 about about 1 and then about about 1 as well. And that should give us a very nice kind of bluish green to give a very nice result. About like that. And if we render that, we can see that looks really nice. You know, it complements our cardboard texture very well. But this is still slightly boring. You know, one coffee cup is nothing much. Let's make it a bit more interesting by adding in several more. And the way that I'm going to do that is first I'm going to hit Shift A, add in a second empty, to which I will go ahead and scale to hit S and then two, uh, how about five along, or hit S and then 5 on the number pad, just make it larger than the whole cup. Then I'm going to hit Control A to apply the scale such that it sees this as the normal size for an empty. And then I'm going to go ahead and select all the objects pertaining to the cup, including my decal empty. And then I'm going to hit Control P and parent to the empty. Oops, and I want to select the lamp and hit Alt P because I don't want that parented. So now I can very easily move my entire cup I can rotate it any way that I want without having to select all the objects. Because what I want to do is I'm first going to hit Shift D. Whoops. I do, however, need to select all the objects in order to Shift D. So now I'll Shift D, move them back. Maybe I'll put position one back in here. I'll go ahead and rotate this just a little bit, maybe like that. Then I'll go ahead and grab the lid on it. And we'll just rotate this 45 degrees, move it down, maybe rotate a little bit more, take it down so it's just touching the floor about there, take it in such that it's just touching the cup, so it's just leaning on the, on, sitting on the floor, leaning against the cup. And then let's go ahead and grab uh, one more, deselecting all my extra pieces, and we'll hit Shift D, move it over. Deselect everything, then just grab the empty. Let's go ahead and rotate this until it fits the floor. Move it up. And we can just zoom in. And using this line right here, I can make this sit on the floor just about perfectly. About like that. And we'll maybe go ahead and rotate this around the local uh, Y axis. So by, I hit R and then double tap Y so I can then just spin the cup and that way it's not sitting on the the bulge point of the um, of the sleeve. So then I'll just rotate this a little bit more and then make it fit on the ground and then I'll go ahead and grab this, pull it into there, maybe rotate around the global Z axis, pull it back Put it in about right there. And let's go ahead and adjust our camera because right now our camera is pretty boring. And I'm first going to move this a bit more. About like that. Make sure it's not intersecting this first one. Then I'll go ahead and grab this one and move it back about like that. There we go, I like that. Now let's go ahead and change the resolution on our camera. And we're gonna go ahead and make this uh, 1200 by 800, give us a kind of a little bit of a wider shot. I'll hit G and M to move out along the camera normal. Maybe rotate a little bit, move it back like this. 
Maybe we'll double tap R to go into trackball ro track rotation, move up a little. Just kind of fine tuning my camera to get a nice angle that I like. If I hit period on my keyboard, I can rotate around the cursor. Zoom out and give me some, some title safe area. So be about right there looks about right. So let's go ahead and render this. But then I want to do one more thing after this, and that is to add in some or, uh, depth of field to add in a bit more interest to this. And the way we'll do that is through node compositing. And it's actually pretty simple. So we can see that this is starting to look pretty cool. You know, it adds a lot more interest than just the, the single cup. And maybe we'll rotate this one just a little bit by hitting comma first to rotate around the individual axis, just about like that. And then let's go ahead and select this, hit Shift S, cursor to selected, hit period to rotate around the cursor, and I'll hit R and Z just to move this around the cup like that, just because I like the previous angle of it better. But I wanna be able to just subtly see the logo here, which maybe I'll just go ahead and select these, rotate them a little bit around the cursor, add in a bit more interest and a little bit more variation. So rendering this, we're just about ready to do the depth of field and then we'll be done for the day. Okay, there we go. So I'm liking the way that that's looking. Um, some of these areas might need to be a little bit brighter. And so let's go ahead, make sure all of our fill lamps are outside of our scenes which this one here, maybe we'll bring this one in, bring this one over. We can maybe brighten these up just a little bit. Maybe take it up to about a 0.65. Render that. And then while we're doing that, let's go ahead and select our camera. Uh, one of the joys of 2.5 is that we can multitask. So, and we're going to show the limits on the camera and with that comes the depth of field. So using this slider here, if I slide this up, you'll notice this little crosshair starts to zoom out or zoom along here. And what I want to do is this is the point of reference for the depth of field. So if I move this in, I'm going to take it right in to the edge of the cup, right about there. Should be just about right. And then let's go ahead and switch or add in another view here, just like this. And we're going to change this over to the node editor, switch over to the compositing nodes right here, and we want to check use nodes. And then what we're going to do is, first off, we have our render layer here, we've got our composite here, and I want to go ahead and hit Shift A and add in a filter and defocus. On the defocus node, we want to first grab our image input here, take it into the image or image output to the image input, and then our Z value to the Z input here. On this, we're going to go ahead and check the use Z buffer such that it pulls in the Z data from here or the depth data basically. We're going to go ahead and set our max blur to about 2.5 so that it can't blur too much so we just have a controlled blur. And then let's go ahead and change our f-stop to about 12. And this is what controls what's in focus and what's not. Let's go ahead and add in a, by hitting shift A, we'll add in a new output and viewer node so that we can see what we're doing. And then on this viewer node, let's go ahead and change our render result here to the viewer node so that we can see the active selection. And you'll notice we're getting the back cup is out of focus, out of focus, and then it starts to come in focus right about here. And you'll notice that it's pretty noisy right now, but if we uncheck the preview option, then it will get much higher quality, uh, actually, well, be good quality. And then something that we can do is change the bokeh type to be hexagonal or any other type that we want. Um, to kind of change how smooth this is. And you would really see these in, uh, in effect if you were to be, if some of these had very bright highlights on them and you were using a large amount of blur. Uh, but since we don't, it doesn't really matter. It's just a very subtle change. And then one last thing that I want to do with this, now that we have our defocus in, is let's go ahead and duplicate our viewer node and hit Shift A and add in a color, um, hue and saturation node to which we'll grab in our color from the defocus we'll switch this over to the viewer we'll click on the viewer so we can see it here let's go ahead and increase the saturation about 
Maybe that's a little too much. Just play with it right about there. Leave that at the default one. Or you can stylize it any way that you want. I personally like it a little bit oversaturated about there. And then we can go ahead and sh shift A and add in a brightness and contrast as well, to which we'll connect the inputs. We'll go ahead and duplicate our viewer node. Organize this a little bit better. We can increase the contrast any way that we want. Maybe go down to about a point or 1.2 just to increase it just slightly. Or we can take it down to see what we think. You know, any way that you want to do it. Maybe we'll take the brightness down some. Or just leave that at the default. Actually, I'm going to remove the brightness and contrast node. Not a big fan of the changes. I kind of like what we just had normally. And so we're actually going to go ahead and leave that there. Although you could go ahead and add in a RGB curves node or any other color correction techniques that you wanted to go ahead and use on the RGB node. Just add it into the image field and there. And maybe we'll just play with the color overall colors here. You can step back between viewer nodes to see the result that you're getting. And I'm definitely no color expert, so I'm sure that there's plenty of people that could say that the colors in this are completely off, but you know, at least for practical purposes and for training purposes, this works quite well. And personally, I kind of like it. But there we go. So and then the last thing we need to do is just go ahead and connect our final node to the composite here such that it brings it into the final result so that when we hit F3 to save our image, we'll be good to go. So there you have it. Um, we just went over how to texture and render our CG Cookie coffee cups, including adding in a paper texture, cardboard texture, using multiple patterns mirrored across UV images. We added in some bump maps, a value image, so as to kind of burn in or print on the, the colors here for our logo, and then created multiple copies of our cup using dupli or using empties with the parented objects such as so that we could manipulate all of them very easily, and then finally polished it off with the drop cloth and the defocus node. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.